Sunday I'm going to be exactly halfway through the three years in which I'm supposed to do my PhD. And so it's quite nice to have this opportunity to reflect on where I am with it today. Um, although it's involved a bit of a mental shift for me today too, since it's all more here, I'm working entirely in Gaelic and it feels strange to be doing this in English, especially since I've got a live audience here in front of me who've never heard a word of English from me in the past. Um, however, Ruination and Decay, how does this title, the title of this series, relate to traditional Gaelic poetry of the 19th century? Well, what it comes down to is the type of opinion which some 20th century scholars published. So let me explain. In 1974, the great Gaelic scholar Rory Machcomish, in English that's Derek Thompson, published a very important book entitled An Introduction to Gaelic Poetry. Thompson was enormously well qualified to do this. A native speaker of Gaelic, born in 1921 in Stornoway, he was the son of James Thompson, who was himself a Gaelic writer and poet, and a pioneer of Gaelic school education. By his early 40s, Derek Thompson himself had become professor of Celtic at Glasgow University and had founded the influential Gaelic cultural journal, Kerem, which he ran together with its associated Gaelic publishing company, for fully 50 years. He inaugurated the Historical Dictionary of Scottish Gaelic, he founded the Gaelic Books Council, he published an incredible range of books and other material about the literature and culture of Gaelic, and he was himself a prolific poet in the language. By the time he was in his 50s, according to Gaelic poet George Campbell A., he had done more for Scottish Gaelic than any other man living. So, when an introduction to Gaelic poetry was published, it was widely regarded as a masterpiece. And in the decades since then, no other single work on the subject has come close to it in thoroughness or in eminence. In the book, Thompson points out the overwhelming importance of poetry in Gaelic culture and traces the entire history of Gaelic poetry from the bardic poets in the times of the earliest written records right through to the middle of the 20th century and beyond. As was the standard practice in Gaelic scholarship at the time, the books written entirely in English with extracts and quotations all translated out of the original Gaelic. The text before bibliography and notes runs to nearly 300 pages and includes detail on the biographies of the poets mentioned, as well as the historical, social and political contexts of their respective works. There's also a certain amount of critical comment, though since the whole subject is so enormous and since contextual areas are also dealt with, the amount of detailed analysis given is limited. Thompson believes that poetry which he considers to be of value can be found in the creations of every century, but he does argue that over time there were fluctuations in the literary merit of the works. The literary quality Thompson values most highly in poetry of any age is innovation. For example, in considering the poetry of the 18th century, he has some reservations about what he calls the conservatism of some of the poets, as they feel the influence of earlier bards. But he says, these are fairly minor qualifications. The central fact is clear. Gallic poetry breathes a new air in the 18th century and shows a new vigour. He refers to the societal changes of the time and talks about the previous styles withering and English literature beginning to be a source of influence. He goes on, it's in the context of these ideas concerning tradition and innovation that 
detractors of an old system and the stimulus of external contacts, together with the breakup of the old social system and the painful building of a new one, that we must consider the poetry of Alistair MacPhaister Alistair, in English Ale Alexander MacDonald, one of the greatest and certainly the most innovative of the 18th century poets. There follows a review of several of MacPhaister Alistair's poems, with opinions expressed on their merits, and with English versions of substantial sections of the verse, which are presumably intended to illustrate those merits, though there's no explanation of how they do so. After the 18th century, the next historical period in which Thompson sees innovation, and therefore poetry of real value, is in the 20th century. In a chapter entitled Renaissance, he says that it is doubtful if innovation has ever featured so largely and persistently in the Gallic verse tradition of a period as in the present century, by which of course he means the 20th century. He goes on to list the merits of a number of poets whose work he commends as particularly innovative in a number of ways, including their deployment of free verse rather than more traditional metrical forms. Amongst those poets are the famous five, and I'm referring neither to Enid Blyton's characters nor to the great Hibernian forward line of the 1950s. The five great innovative Gallic poets of the 20th century were Sir Maclean, George Campbell Hay, Ian Crichton Smith, Donald Macaulay, and yes, Derek Thompson himself. So, innovation and merit in the 18th century, and then a renaissance in the 20th. What about in between? Well, this is where, in Thompson's view, and to use the title in this, the title of this series of sessions, ruination and decay can be seen. As is well known, because of societal changes, many Gales emigrated to Nova Scotia, and amongst the 19th century poets who did so, Thompson says, there were occasional new themes suggested by the new environment, but no new voice or style. While here in Scotland, he says that there was much verse of an unambitious nature. He then lists seven poets whose work, he says, is typical of the century, the 19th century. I don't have pictures of all seven of them, but I've got pictures of four. That's John McLaughlin, Evan McCall, Donald McKechnie, and Neil MacLeod. The other three are John Campbell, Malcolm McFarlane, and John McFadgen. Thompson uses the terms village verse and local verse to refer to their work, and incidentally, part of Baller, or township poetry, is the term now used in many places, and it's the term I favour. Over the course of a number of pages, Thompson quotes translations of some of their poetry, uh, referring to the invented detail and spurious emotion, which he says are to be seen in such work, along with uh, emotional experience which was not deeply imagined. He uses words like desultory and inert, dull and pedestrian, and with a striking image of his own, he states that the new Gallic poetry of the 19th century largely turns its back on its own relatively learned aristocratic tradition and grovels contentedly in its novel surroundings. Above all, he refers to the clichés, which he says pervade the whole corpus. Obviously, to a critic who places particular emphasis on innovation, cliché is anathema. <laughs> 
The Gallic poet and novelist Angus Peter Campbell uses the image of a Sputnik sailing overhead in the night to show his opinion that innovation has gone past the Gallic world and left it untouched. In my opinion, the same image is entirely apt to describe the literary criticism of the 20th century passing overhead and barely touching Gallic poetry, certainly of the 19th century. As I mentioned earlier, in the 300 pages or so, Thompson deals with many, many areas of learning which are connected with Gallic poetry. Historical context, what we can learn from the poetry about the social history of the time, or about genealogies of people mentioned, the political aspects of events that stimulated the making of poems, and so on. The book is, in a sense, just what its title implies. Just what it says on the tin. It's an introduction to all aspects of Gallic poetry through the ages, and because it's almost entirely in English, it may well have appealed to a wider audience than if Thompson had written it in his own first language. However, as a result of its dealing with lots of topics related to poetry, it's as if there's very little space left for detailed analysis of the poetic techniques used in any age and so very little of that features in the book. Opinions are expressed, illustrated by rather lengthy translated pieces, but seldom is there detailed reference to a text or analysis of a poet's craft. It seems to me that opinions expressed about any of the poetry cannot be seen as other than exactly that, the personal opinions of the writer, with no backing such as close reading and detailed analysis would give. The further point is that Thompson, as well as being a literary critic, was himself a poet, a modern poet, and one of the five great poets of the 20th century. It's perhaps unsurprising, therefore, that he recommends the sort of poetry he himself was writing and is less positive about poetry that's completely different, such as village poetry, or as many would say, traditional poetry. Another of that group of great 20th century poets, whom I refer to as the famous five, Donald Macaulay, was also a professor of Celtic at Glasgow University, and he published another influential book about Gaelic poetry two years after Thompson's magnum opus. Entitled No of Art at Gaelic, Modern Scottish Gaelic Poems, this is a bilingual collection of poetry by each of those five modern bards, with an introduction given in both languages too. In this introduction, in this introduction to the book, Macaulay explains how, in his view, modern poetry is superior to the traditional poetry of the time, and in doing so, he echoes many of Thompson's thoughts. He says that the repertoire of traditional poets narrowed and became stereotyped, with a decay of rhetorical power, an over-reliance on formulae, mixed metaphor, and dead regularities. However, Macaulay's aims, like Thompson's, clearly do not include undertaking the sort of close reading or detailed literary analysis which might result in corroboration of such opinions with textual evidence. Indeed, the amount of literary analysis of traditional Gallic poetry that has ever been undertaken is limited. In more recent times, both Ronald Black and Donald Meek have shown the way, and so perhaps the time is ripe for a systematic analysis of township poetry. I certainly hope so, because that's what I'm doing. <laughs> In other literatures, such as English, many different types of literary analysis have been undertaken over the years especially during the course of the 20th century. Anyone looking to analyse texts can do so using psychoanalytic 
literary criticism based on the theories of Sigmund Freud or reader response criticism or structuralist literary theory or deconstruction or Marxist literary criticism or feminist literary criticism or Bactinian or Foucaultian analysis or new historicism. Indeed, there are so many types that Vincent B. Leach, the editor of the Norton Anthology of Theory and Criticism, writes, who has the time and expertise to make intelligent choices? Well, major figures in the field of literary criticism have included T.S. Eliot, F.R. Leavis, William Empson, I.A. Richards, Northrop Fry, and Cleanth Brooks. And all of them have in common the belief that close analysis of a text is what is important. In his book on poetry and poets, T.S. Eliot looks closely at the poems of various writers, considering a range of poetic techniques which they use. F.R. Leavis recommends close reading. And William Empson was a major figure in what was termed New Criticism, whose proponents recommend close consideration of a text, looking at features such as structure, irony, symbolism, and verbal ambiguity. I think a case can be made for the application of the techniques of New Criticism to Gallic Township poetry, so that a proper appraisal can be made of its qualities. I.A. Richards was of the view that the literary critic should use surgical procedures to reach valid judgments, and in chapter 17 of his seminal book, Principles of Literary Criticism, under the chapter titled The Analysis of a Poem, he shows the process which he recommends, involving a detailed analysis of the features of a poem so as to explain how it works to express the poet's meaning. Northrop Fry says that objectivity is important in the process. As he says in his Anatomy of Criticism, genuine criticism progresses toward making the whole of literature intelligible. And he goes on that true criticism depends on avoiding what he calls what belongs only to the history of taste and therefore follows the vacillations of fashionable taste. Cleanth Brooks was another advocate of new criticism and he offers 10 rules for close reading. First of all, you pick a single text. Then you avoid personal emotional response so that what you're coming up with is objective. Then you do your analysis of stylistic and aesthetic features uh, without paying too much attention to historical inquiry. Uh, the fourth point was you read it as often as uh, may be required. Um, Fifthly, you look closely at the text, presupposing that it may be intricate and complex uh, and unified. Uh, the sixth point is um, you expect it to be unified and you subordinate incongruities and conflicts of interest uh, to the overall unity. Uh, the next point is you show paradox, irony and ambiguity in resolving disunities. Uh, the eighth point is you treat the text as if it's impersonal and autonomous, an autonomous aesthetic artifact, not depending on historical context, for example. And the second last point, you focus on imagery, metaphorical language, and not, and he says absolutely not, on psychology, morality, sociology, or political economy. And he finishes by saying you should try to be the ideal reader, by which he means without uh, too much subjectivity involved in the process. Now, 
I've been talking about literary criticism of the 20th century, and it's certainly true that new criticism developed in the middle of that century and is therefore no longer as new as it was. However, a brief look at recent PhD theses on English poetry from various universities in England and in Scotland has shown that close reading techniques are still in use in such contexts. I think the application of them to Gaelic poetry is overdue. It's time that Angus Peter Campbell Sputnik took a, a look at Gaelic township poetry and close reading gives us a strategy for doing so by means of considering the poetic techniques used by each bard to convey his or her meaning. But at the end of the day, if we use a 20th century approach to poetry of the 19th century, are we liable to run into the same issue that Derek Thompson and Donald Macaulay encountered, that it's full of clichés? Or is township poetry in some way qualitatively different? From 20th century. Well, from, from poetry of other centuries, possibly. In Gaelic communities of the 19th century, the ability to read and write was not too uncommon, thanks to the work of schools such as those under the aegis of the SSPCK. But for all that, there was an oral tradition of Gaelic poetry that could be traced back through the centuries. Within this tradition, the bards would bring important news to the people of their communities, they would entertain, they would celebrate great, great victories in battle, they would lament the deaths of important people. In the 19th century, this tradition was still powerful, with at least one bard in most communities of any size. Most commonly, their poetry would be heard in the form of song, listened to by the whole community gathered together in a Cayley house. Nowadays, we tend to think of poetry being read in silence by an individual whose eyes are on the page. But in the Gallic world, in the days before the 20th century, and in fact well into that century in many places, in general, it would be an audience who would be enjoying the poetry in performance, together, in a public space, with the ears in the main rather than with the eyes. For this reason, it has to be accepted that the delivery and consumption of township poetry as it was have much in common with those of folk song. Some 19th century Gallic township bards did indeed have limited abilities with the written word and would compensate for that by being able to make up the lyrics of entire songs without the use of writing and then retain them in the memory along with thousands of other lines which were never committed to paper. Incidentally, there's also evidence that some could make poetry extempore in performance, literally making it up as they went along. Above all, their poems were delivered aloud as songs to be listened to by an audience, rather than published in book form to be read in silence by an individual. However, there was definitely interaction between the oral tradition and the printed world. In Gallic communities of the 19th century, there were books, and there were people who could read and write. Gallic poetry was published throughout the century. For example, as early as 1811, Dolman Oran, Donald of the Sons, father of Neil MacLeod, one of the 19th century poets I showed a wee while ago, uh, he published a book of his poetry. And when a major collection called Nvoranihe, the singer, came out in 1879, it put written texts of more than 300 songs in the hands of those who had the money to buy it and the ability to read it. And these songs would then also 
being the ears of the communities to which those purchasers belonged, exerting their influence on others in those communities who might be poets themselves. It therefore cannot be said that township poetry of the 19th century is an example of oral literature in the truest sense of the term. But what can be said is that it shows influence from both the oral tradition and written literature. In a declaration of poetic rights and values, which was put together by Steve Zeitlin, Bob Holman, and Amelia Backer, supported by various others, it is said that oral traditions precede written poetry, but written traditions do not supersede the oral. They exist alongside. Likewise, Hedda Jason of the University of Tel Aviv writes, Oral literature, especially in verse form, sorry that's a bit small, oral literature, especially in verse form, makes use of numerous syntactic and prosodic features which are similar to those in the written literature of the same language. The two literatures have in fact influenced each other throughout history. Jason goes on to show that there are three sorts of literature which she calls respectively oral, high written and common written. As will be understood, oral literature is the kind that can be found in societies where there is no writing. The poetry of high written literature depends entirely on writing and common written literature has features of both. Jason also uses the term an ethnopoetic work for a traditional poem or song or for an oral work of any genre. She says that an ethnopoetic work exists only in its performance and is presented to an audience in live performance rather than being appreciated privately by the reader. She goes on that such a work has no set text unlike works of high written uh, literature which are stable and unique. In addition, Edda Jason continues that ethnopoetic works are built according to a literary canon by which she means a set of rules of composition and a lexicon of contentual units. She denies that the ethnopoetic composer or singer is aware of these rules, but she says that they give a structure which supports the creative process. She says, because the literary canon is unconscious, the performer is held unwittingly within its framework. This has the effect of reducing the flexibility available to the oral composer as compared to the writer working in the high written format who is free to create entirely new structures and expressions. One effect of realising this fundamental difference between oral and high written literatures is to cast doubt upon the, youthful, the, the usefulness of an automatic transfer of analytical tools from one field of research to the other. Although township poetry is not true oral literature, but literature which was influenced by the oral tradition, it can be said that it is, in Hedda Jason's terms, common written literature. And so it owes enough to ethnopoetry to suggest that the criteria of ethnopoetics may be useful in the process of its re-evaluation. So, what is the study of ethnopoetics? Well, it's a rather new concept in terms of the criticism of Gallic literature, although scholars in other disciplines have been involved in it for several decades at least. There's a website called Ethnopoetics, which is curated by the American poet, translator and anthologist Jerome Rothenberg, who was also for 10 years Professor of Visual Arts and Literature 
at the University of California. The website gives a useful introduction to ethnopoetics, showing as it does the breadth and variety of the subject in terms of genre and global spread, with quite a bit of emphasis on anthropology and especially linguistic anthropology. There's even a bit of Gaelic in it too, but just to show the sounds of the vocables which feature in Pushkabiel Gaelic mouth music. Anyway, Rothenberg says the term ethnopoetics can be used in three senses. Firstly, it's a comparative approach to poetry and related arts with a characteristic but not exclusive emphasis on what he calls stateless, low technology cultures and on oral and non-literate forms of verbal expression. Secondly, ethnopoetics applies to the poetry and ideas about the poetry in those cultures. And thirdly, it's a movement or tendency in contemporary poetry, literature and social science devoted to such interests. And then in tracing the background to the topic, he writes, the history of such an ethnopoetics covers at least the last 200 years, during which time it has functioned as a questioning of the culturally bounded poetics and poetry of high European culture. The website provides a platform for a number of other writers too, and amongst them is the late Dennis Tedlock, formerly Professor of English and of Anthropology at the State University of New York. Tedlock says, ethnopoetics is a decentered poetics, an attempt to hear and read the poetries of distant others outside the Western tradition as we know it now. In my opinion, the ethnopoetic outlook gives an insight which is potentially very helpful in looking at Gallic township poetry. And just in passing, there are two other things I would say. First, in being delivered in some form to an audience, Township poetry is what's often referred to as a performative genre. And as Jerome Rothenberg puts it, performative genres have the function of letting a community's consciousness know periodically what its subconsciousness is up to. Township poetry is tightly woven into the values of the community. And that's a point I'll be looking at quite closely in my research over the next few months. Secondly, and in the words of Dennis Tedlock again, ethnopoetics does not merely contrast the poetics of ethnics with just plain poetics, but implies that any poetics is always an ethnopoetics. He says our main interest will indeed be the poetries of people who are ethnically distant from ourselves, but it is precisely uh, by the effort to reach into distances that we bring our own ethnicity and the poetics that goes with it into fuller consciousness. One of the fundamental tenets of ethnopoetics is that we should be open-minded about the workings of any type of poetry. Rather than bringing along with us the baggage of preconceptions which we've formed in studying, for example, high Britain literature. John Miles Foley exhorts us to read and understand oral poetry on its own terms. In a sense, Foley's not a million miles from I.A. Richards, who says that the literary critic should be adept at experiencing without eccentricities the state of mind relevant to the work of art he is judging. We who have all been through an education which is substantially based on writing can think that our outlook is the correct one or even the normal one, but maybe it isn't. In 1982, Walter Ong pointed out 
all of the some 3,000 languages spoken that exist today, that's 1982, only some 78 have a literature. There is as yet no way to calculate how many languages have disappeared or been transmuted into other languages before writing came along. I mentioned a moment ago the values of a community and the performer of township poetry in the 19th century had the opportunity and the duty to endorse those values. That's one aspect of the relationship between the performer and his or her audience. But there are others too, things like an enjoyable or attractive or moving melody with a chorus that gives the opportunity for joining in. A story that captivates the listeners with characters with whom they can identify themselves or even whom they know personally. And words and images that they recognize and relate to. Images quite often drawn from the local area. As can be seen, a common factor in such aspects of the performance is familiarity. And such familiarity would be vital in establishing the rapport between performer and audience. Or in the word used in this context by the great Gaelic scholar John McInnes, solidarity. In this situation, familiarity breeds solidarity. Now this brings us, you see, to cliches, expressions and images which appear again and again. The great work done in the 20th century by Milman Parry and Albert B. Lord resulted in the oral formulaic theory, which in brief explains that the current expressions in oral epics give support to the performer in the construction of his or her works. John Miles Foley accepts this, but goes further in his theory of immanent art, postulating that there may be aesthetic reasons for the occurrence of repeated expressions too. Del Himes takes this point up and refers to the recurrent arousal and satisfying of expectation by ethnopoetic works. I believe that this is what we see in the so-called cliches of township poetry, and I believe it's of particular interest for aesthetic reasons in the imagery. Imagery is enormously important in ethnopoetics. As Hedda Jason puts it, ethnopoetry is to a great extent couched in symbolic terms. Symbolic poetic images are put forward instead of descriptions. But what type of imagery? Using ideas from Roman Jakobsen, Moira Nianrahan has explained the difference between the two major types of imagery, metaphor and metonymy. Metaphor, she says, is established on similarity, uh, whereas uh, metonymy is based on contiguity or association. Metaphors generally depend for their effect on surprise or shock. Oh yes, I see the similarity. I hadn't thought of that before. Metonymy, on the other hand, depends on familiarity. As Professor Nianrachan puts it, to understand metonymy properly requires a prior understanding on the part of the listener or reader of the connection between the literal and figurative meanings of the trope. Metonymy doesn't depend on shock or surprise. It depends on prior understanding. Or to put it in another way, it depends on familiarity. She says, metonymy is arguably the literary equivalent of a closely knit social structure where individuality as opposed to connectedness is not overly promoted. 
and where the poets roll is to remain more or less within the status quo, rehearsing in persuasive and polished ways versions of the familiar. Some 20th century scholars saw ruination and decay in the form of cliché and narrow stereotypes in Gallic township poetry of the 19th century. I believe that if we go forward to consider all the features of the poetry with the broad-mindedness which ethnopoetic study recommends, it may be that we find that such features are there for genuinely aesthetic reasons. After that, we can decide whether we think they work or not, but such evaluation can be based on proper understanding and on a detailed analysis. Thanks for listening and uh, I'm happy now to take comments or questions.